My friends at Easy Cater are workplace catering pros, helping you find food for everything from daily employee meals to staff meetings and special events. Visit easycater.com slash leader assistant to find out more. Hi, I'm Connor Sweeney, and today's leadership quote is, courage is what it takes to stand up and speak. Courage is also what it takes to sit down and listen. Richard Branson. The Leader Assistant Podcast exists to encourage and challenge assistants to become confident, game-changing leader assistants. Thank you for listening to the Leader Assistant Podcast. Assistants are workplace heroes, and as such, transitioning safely and securely from remote work to an in-office environment is top of mind. And we all know that every superhero needs a sidekick. Enter today's sponsor, Swiped On. Swiped On is the fastest growing visitor and employee management software. With tools like contactless sign-in, visitor screening, and evacuation management, Swiped On can help provide the peace of mind every assistant and their team deserves. So the next time you hear, what's your plan for the office as we return to work? Or how will the hybrid workplace look for us? You can respond confidently knowing Swiped On has you covered. To learn more or sign up for a free 14-day trial, visit Swiped on.com slash leader assistant. That's swiped on.com slash leader assistant. And when you're ready to move forward, be sure to use my exclusive discount code for 20% off their annual plan. The discount code is leader 20. That's leader two zero for 20% off their annual plan. So reopen your business safely today with swiped on. Hey friends, thanks for tuning in to the Leader Assistant Podcast. It's your host, Jeremy Burrows. And today I'm super excited to be speaking with Connor Sweeney. Connor is the Chief of Staff to the co-founder and CFO at Box. Connor, how's it going? It's going really well, Jeremy. Thanks for, for having me. I'm really excited to be here today. And tell us a little bit about Box and who Box is for those who uh, haven't heard of it. Absolutely. Yeah. So Box is a cloud content management platform. Uh, We are headquartered in the San Francisco Bay Area. We've been a public company for uh, close to seven years now. We have about 2,500 employees worldwide and You know, we're uh, really excited to continue to power how the world collaborates. And I know for me, it's a really amazing organization to be a part of. So, Great. And how did you end up at Box? Yeah. So I've been with Box now for close to two years. And um, I had a, a... a mentor of mine who actually is still with the company who, who helped to kind of bring me in. I was really looking for a a change in, in career and focus and was looking to make an external jump. And there was an, you know, this opportunity came about at at a really great time. And so it was a a mentor and friend of mine that, that brought me into the organization. And uh, funny enough, she and I work very closely today. So it's funny how things work. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, It's all about who you know, right? It's, it's a, definitely a big part of it. Yes. <laughs> uh, so, okay. So tell us, um, we're going to, we're going to get into the chief of staff role. Um, there's a lot of talk, especially in the executive assistant world, um, you know, about what exactly is a chief of staff. Um, is it a natural progression from, you know, the executive assistant position, um, and, and so on and so forth. So we'll get into that in a second, but why don't you tell us just a little bit about yourself? Uh, where are you from? And, um, maybe one interesting, uh, fact that we should know about you. <laughs> sounds, sounds great. So I, uh, I was born and raised in new England, uh, in the beautiful state of Maine. I spent the first 22 years of my life, 
uh, in Southern Maine and, and actually went on to do my uh, higher education undergraduate degree in Maine. And uh, right after graduating from college, I made the decision to move out to beautiful California. I was really eager very early on in my business studies to um, to take on a career in the world of technology. And that mixed with just really optimizing for some warmer weather uh, is what ultimately brought me out to California. I started my career, Jeremy, with HP uh, and was with HP for uh, close to, to five years, the first five years of my career. Uh, and from there, went on to uh, spend some time at Walmart and then uh, from Walmart and now here at Box. And so I've spent you know, a, a majority of my seven plus years as a professional in the world of technology and um, have been here in California for the last seven years as well. And not too long after I moved here, I met my, my beautiful wife, um, who uh, was a California native. And now she and I at the moment are, are kind of nomads. We're, we're both professionally based in the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, but like many, we've been working remote for uh, over a year now. And we've been down here in Southern California, just spending more time with, with family. Awesome. So what's your, you and your wife's favorite, um, kind of travel activity? Do you like hiking, biking? Do you like skiing? What, what do you guys like to do? We have very different perspectives on this, which is, which is <laughs> funny. They, they say opposites attract and I couldn't agree more. Uh, you know, for me, Jeremy, one of my, my biggest hobbies is actually wine. Um, I, I spend a lot of my free time uh, reading up on wine, kind of studying wine, uh, taking classes on wine, and of course, living in, in California. It's a great place to be for wine lovers. So we do spend a lot of time out in the vineyards tasting wine. So, you know, for me, when, when we travel, um, and that's relevant because, you know, I'm, I'm constantly optimizing for that downtime, right? Like how can we just relax, you know, kick up our feet, have a glass of wine, whether it be on the beach, by the pool, on the mountain. Um, but my, my wife is, is a lot more adventurous than I am. She loves museums. Uh, she loves exploring. And so we have a really good time when we're on vacation, kind of bringing those two things together. It's usually a very well-rounded trip. Uh, by the end of it, we've gotten in the relaxing part, the, you know, the sipping wine by the pool part, but, but again, she's uh, definitely more exploratory than I am. So it's a total opposite approach to, to vacations, but we, we make it work and we, we have a lot of fun doing it. Nice. And I, I love that, uh, you know, you said wine is your hobby and I didn't even know that was a hobby. You could technically call wine a hobby, but hey, that works. Some people would call wine a, a, a problem, but you call it a hobby. I love it. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Well, you know, and, <laughs> and it, it took living in a, in a place. I mean, ha having grown up for the first 22 years of my life in New England, where, you know, the, the world of wine is not nearly what it is in a place like California, where you've got the Napa Valley and Sonoma and all these like incredible wine regions. Um, it's just really, really fascinating. And for me, uh, I actually have a cousin who works in the wine industry. He's a sommelier. He's a certified wine expert and he works at country clubs and he's a wine educator. And it really took spending a lot more time with him to come to appreciate it a lot more than just, wow, this tastes great. And it's a great way to kind of decompress at the end of the day, because there's so much history and science, specifically chemistry, you know, around uh, wine. And so just kind of the diversity of the topic and mixed with the fact that, you know, I enjoy the taste of it. It's, it's become a, a real hobby of mine. Nice. Love, love it. Love it. Love it. All right. Well, let's get in to kind of the meat of the episode. Now that we've had our wine, um, chief of staff. So how did you end up as a chief of staff and is it something that, or a title even that you, um, aspired to or wanted to do, or did you just kind of fall into it? Yeah. So I guess to answer the second part of your question first, yes, I knew very early on in my career that this was a tour of duty that I wanted for myself. I actually remember the moment it became very real for me. Um, a couple of years into my career at Hewlett Packard Enterprise, I was on a business trip in Las Vegas for uh, a big customer event that they were hosting. And through a colleague, I was introduced to a gentleman named Brad Harwell. And just for the mention, I, I hope he listens to this episode, uh, who at the time was 
the chief of staff for uh, HPE's North American Enterprise Group, which was a, a five billion, yes, billion with a B dollar organization, right? This was a huge role. And, and Brad had actually spent much of his career as a marketing and, and, and go-to-market executive within Compaq and then later for a number of years with HP prior to stepping into this role. And it was spending time with him throughout that week and learning more about his world that really made me want this for myself at some point. It's everything from what he had exposure to, what he was learning, the relationships that he was developing. All of it was just super fascinating to me. And, you know, I'll also mention that I've always had a, a keen interest in leadership and specifically the correlation between leadership and organizational performance. And, you know, aside from being a senior leader, or having a seat in the C-suite myself, you know, this was a role and is a role um, that provides kind of one of very few ways to see all of that come together. Um, you know, I'm also someone who aspires to sit in a senior leadership role at some point, and what better way to learn the ropes than, you know, to partner with those that are already there. You know, chiefs of staff get a very unique opportunity to not only see all of the moving pieces at a 30,000 foot view, but you know, really get to watch leaders maneuver, maneuver through that environment, which is truly, you know, kind of for me, a one in a, a million opportunity. And so I, I always tell people there's really no better leadership accelerator than, than this role. And to kind of answer the first part of your question, as far as how I ended up here, you know, I've spent a majority of my career, Jeremy, straddling the line of business operations and corporate communications. I mentioned earlier, I spent almost five years of my career uh, at Hewlett Packard Enterprise, I spent spent the first few years as a business operations analyst. You know, later moved on to become a business operations manager, working across organizations such as global procurement, global real estate, IT, um, really kind of across a majority of of um, some of the more technical functions. Uh, you know, kind of within the finance world at HP. My last gig at HP was actually with the Global Real Estate Group, where I had this you know, amazing opportunity to lead a portion of the company's West Coast real estate operations team, which is what geographically brought me to uh, Silicon Valley in the first place. And kind of beyond my years at HP and really focused on all things ops and strategy, uh, I then went on to spend some time at Walmart working in their e-commerce business and uh, had this very unique opportunity to lead all aspects of executive communications for their uh, kind of chief HR officer and, and global HR organization, as well as their corporate development organization, which was you know, at the time going through a lot, there was a lot of M&A activity on the e-commerce side of Walmart when I was there. And, and so it was a real phenomenal opportunity uh, in general. And, and I had an amazing amount of exposure to some really incredible uh, senior leaders there. Uh, and as you mentioned at the beginning, I'm now a box where I'm, you know, principal and chief of staff for their global finance and ops organization and, you know, have the, the distinct honor and privilege of partnering very closely with our co-founder and CFO, um, and, and really kind of run all things from biz ops to communications and, and program management for, for his organization. So uh, a lot of what brought me to this role is one, just the eagerness of knowing I wanted to step into this world at some point and then kind of get this perspective at some point. Uh, but two, my background kind of lent itself very uniquely to, um, you know, what chiefs of staff do. That's great. So that's perfect segue to my next question. In one or two sentences, you kind of uh, used a, a few more sentences to describe a little bit of it just now, but in one or two sentences, can you describe what a chief of staff does? Yeah. So look, chief of chiefs of staff are dot connectors, skilled operators, and problem solvers that partner with senior leaders and or larger organizations to drive oftentimes at scale efficiency and effectiveness, solve challenges before they become bigger problems and create and maintain relationships that ultimately help to keep the engine running, right? The engine of the organization you're supporting or the business at large. Uh, a chief of staff is often the, the right hand to a chief executive and serves as a, I like to call it key multiplier for that chief executive and their, their leadership team. 
So to break it down into three buckets, um, like your LinkedIn summary does, uh, you had kind of three categories, business operations, strategic initiatives, and executive communications. Can you share maybe a quick example of what your day-to-day looks like in each of those three areas? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, every day, and I mean every day, is different in a role like this. And I think starting with the business operations bucket, this is a really interesting area that for many companies is gaining quite a bit of steam right now, right? You see a lot more organizations that are standing up dedicated business operations functions, those functions oftentimes include kind of a hodgepodge if it could be, you know, business analytics, data science, program or project management. So it's, it's a very interesting world uh, and much like the role of chief of staff, a bit of a nuanced one at the moment. But for me in, in my role, this is where the efficiency and effectiveness comes into play. So business operations for me, um, you know, on a call it month to month, quarter to quarter basis is everything from working with corporate finance to lead and drive our annual strategic planning process or managing and owning our organizational level OKR process to partnering with my boss's leadership team to drive accountability around our workforce and location strategy. So much of business operations is about driving key initiatives that are connected to keeping the organization healthy, so to speak. So delivering on our strategic commitments when we say we will, holding ourselves accountable to you know, uh, large scale budgets, et cetera, et cetera. Executive communications is an interesting one for me. As I alluded to briefly earlier, I came into this role with some really unique experience having worked with C-level leaders at a Fortune One retailer from a pure play communications perspective. I saw the impact that communication strategy can have on a complex, fast-paced organization. So I was really eager to aggressively weave that into my remit as a chief of staff. And for, for what it's worth, you know, communications for most chiefs of staff is part of the remit in, in a variety of different ways. It could be external, internal, both. But for me, kind of having come into the role with that experience, I was very eager to, to kind of weave that in in a very specific way. And, you know, specifically executives comms leadership in this role is partnering very closely with my principal leader to ensure there's consistency in how and what he and his leaders communicate within their organizations and also consistency in how tops down and bottoms up messaging come together in a very productive way. You know, chiefs of staff are most importantly culture carriers for their organization. So it's important to have that ear to the ground mentality uh, and have that play a big role in how and what a leader is communicating at any given time. And I, lastly, on the strategic program management, strategic initiative leadership, you know, whatever you want to call it, this, this um, is really taken oftentimes large, complex, messy projects that don't always have a home in the organization and bringing them across the finish line. You know, program project management, it's a huge part of any chief of staff role. Uh, You know, I've personally in this role worked on everything from helping to stand up various phases around our company's location and workforce strategy to putting specific frameworks in place to track our free cash flow progress against our targets and commitments that we've set to partnering with leaders across the company to to drive progress around the reopening of our offices in a post-COVID world. This is where really where I see the most diversity in my role. And again, it's important to call out that oftentimes the projects or initiatives that chiefs of staff work on are, they're critically important to leadership, but oftentimes struggle to gain momentum due to the lack of organizational ownership. So, you know, in in this situation, and for most chiefs of staff, you're expected to come in, you know, break down those barriers and ultimately just find a way to get stuff done and forge partnerships to do that in in environments of uncertainty. And so that's, that's kind of how I break down those, those three buckets. And that's great. That's like super, super helpful. There's so many, um, 
assistants that reach out asking about the chief of staff role. And I'm excited to uh, share this episode with them because you just um, summarized it greatly. So thanks for doing that. Um, so how do you partner with assistants, uh, specifically C-suite assistants at Box in your role? So it's a great question. And, you know, I'll, I'll start by saying, and, and, you know, while there's absolutely some adjacency in these roles, right, kind of the, the EA and the chief of staff, um, as far as stakeholder management and, and the commitment to a senior leader, the roles are quite unique and quite different from each other, right? And, you know, to me, the biggest difference is boiled down to, you know, time and responsibility, the, the now slash in the moment versus the kind of future moments, the tactics versus the strategy, but, you know, different topic for, for a different time. But, you know, my bosses, EA and I are, are tied at the hip, Jeremy. We agreed very early on that a successful partnership between the two of us was critically important to the success of the org and our leaders. You know, as much as I want to say that there's a, a secret magical sauce to this partnership, and for some there may be, um, you know, for me, there, there really isn't. Like any business partnership framework, um, you know, respect, trust, and knowing when to stay in your own lanes is, is really important and, and creates the environment for a very successful partnership. So, um, yeah, I, again, kind of the way that I work with, you know, C-suite assistants at Box is in a variety of different ways. They can be very, very helpful in certain programs or projects that we're trying to push across the finish line. Their perspective on just the amount of time, right, that a leader has to dedicate to certain things is, is a very, um, very unique and necessary perspective for us as chiefs of staff to have as we're trying to align kind of time allocation to what it is strategically that we're focused on as an organization. So, um, you know, I've had the philosophy since day one in this role that, um, you know, the, the partnership, the EA chief of staff partnership is, is really, really critical to the success of, of any organization that has the two roles that are coexisting. So I, I just got on a, got off of a uh, coaching call um, this week with an assistant who is in a new role and is working with a chief of staff that uh, to be frank is just kind of at a lower level than the assistant is. And she's really struggling with like, okay, how do I not just step in and do their job um, but also kind of help, help them grow. And, you know, there's this, there's just an interesting dynamic when you step into a role, um, they're supporting the, the same executive and the chief of staff is, is new to the, the three, um, three point triangle, if you will. Um, any suggestions to those assistants listening who may be struggling with that relationship and partnership, um, between the chief of staff? Yeah, it's it's a really interesting question. Um, you know, I think for your specific example, what's what's most interesting is most chiefs of staff are are new to their role, right? So if you if you think about like the evolution of the chief of staff role, it's it's oftentimes not a role that's optimized for somebody to be in it for a really long period of time, right? Chiefs of staff roles are kind of most commonly I hate to call them rotational roles, but there's usually kind of like a two to three year shelf life on the role because oftentimes the person that's stepping into that role is stepping into that role for you know a pretty specific reason to develop skills in a certain area, to kind of forge partnerships, to then kind of go on to you know the the next thing, and so um, now I, I'll say that kind of the nuance there is is that I I personally do know you know, some chiefs of staff that have been chiefs of staff more than once. And I have the utmost respect for them because I don't know how they mentally and physically do it. <laughs> um, it's for me, one of those roles that, you know, you do it for a few years and you exhaust yourself and you take in all that you can, and then you kind of move on. So uh, I'll say uh, kind of back to my original point that most chiefs of staff are coming in relatively new to the world of being a chief of staff. Right. And 
it can absolutely be challenging, I'm sure, for executive assistants who have been with an executive for maybe a much longer period of time or have you know been working in the EA world for a lot longer than the chief of staff has been working in the chief of staff world. But I, again, I think it really all comes down to kind of you know partnership communication and intention. Right. So, you know, one of the things that I was really clear with my boss on when I came into this role is, you know, why did you hire me? Right. What are the things that you're optimizing for that that I can help kind of drive across the finish line that I can help accelerate? Right. And so I think it's really important. And you kind of alluded to a triangle earlier. But when I think about like a principal leader, an executive assistant and a chief of staff, there needs to be a certain level of alignment between those three around who's doing what, why they're doing what, and ultimately like what, what the goals are, right? There needs to be a sense of leadership advocacy in the upfront to really help set the tone for what will hopefully be a very successful relationship between that chief of staff and the EA. So I would challenge the, the EA in this particular example as someone who sounds like has a bit more experience with the company organization leader to, to really do what they can to kind of liaise that sense of, you know, what is it that the senior leader is looking for? What is it kind of in my world and with my experience that I can do to help this chief of staff be, be successful? I would challenge that EA and that chief of staff to spend a lot of time in the upfront developing kind of parameters and criteria around their partnership framework, right? Who's doing this thing and who's doing that thing, right? As it relates to kind of like staying in one lane versus the other, like getting very, very specific around who's doing what so that there really isn't any murkiness or question marks around, you know, kind of, again, that that broader partnership framework. So I, you know, kind of long-winded way of saying, um, you know, collaboration, communication, uh, and then that leadership that advocacy from the senior leader is, is really, for me, I think, kind of the, the ultimate trifecta for, for driving a successful partnership, especially between those two roles. Hmm. Yeah, that's well said, well said. And I, uh, you know, it's, it, it's interesting because the, you were talking about trust earlier and, just kind of the communication between the roles and then clarifying the expectations is such a huge thing. Like um, I was talking to a different assistant several months ago and she was like, you know, when we started, we being the executive, the chief of staff and the assistant, when we started working together, we didn't clarify the roles and, and, and make it extra clear on who was supposed to do what. And so there were there, the chief of staff and the assistant were stepping on each other's toes, like all the time. And, you really just have to nip that in the bud early on and, and get that clear. Uh, just like you said. So, yeah, uh, well, I think, you know, there, there is, in my opinion, a duty of the principal leader to, to really be very intentional about what he or she is looking for in the roles, right. Mm-hmm. I mean, specifically the chief of staff role, uh, you know, as I alluded to uh, briefly earlier is it's gaining a lot of momentum, right now. I mean, it's a really hot role for a lot of companies for a lot of different reasons. And what I see is a lot of leaders saying, well, I want a chief of staff. And Mm -hmm. here's kind of some high level buckets of the things that I'm hoping my chief of staff can accomplish. But that's kind of where the car stops a lot of the times, right? There isn't that kind of next level of intentionality with what are some of the things I really want this resource to do and drive? And what are some of the partnerships that I'm, you know, th- that are really important for this role to kind of forge throughout the journey of the role? And so, you know, I've I challenge all senior leaders to be very, very intentional um, and to be very thoughtful when kind of hiring for these roles because, you know, in a in a great situation where you have that alignment and you have your kind of lane set and your bucket set and your, you know, idea set, it can be one of the most amazing, effective and efficient partnerships ever. Um, but when you don't take the time to really drive that level of advocacy with the leadership team and drive that kind of, you know, dot connecting between the EA, the chief of staff and the leader, like that's where things can get really challenging and very murky. And I've, I've seen it a lot. I hear about it a lot, um, as I'm sure you do as well. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of, uh, gray areas, um, in the role sometimes, and even just, even just between, you know, high level senior executive business partner slash executive assistants often, uh, this kind of moves on to my next question. Often, 
you know, and I'm, I'm sure I am 100% positive that as you were explaining the chief of staff role, there were probably dozens, if not hundreds of assistants whose ears perked up and were like, wait a minute, that's what I do. Like, wait, am I a chief of staff? But because there are a lot of executive assistants who functionally um, are, are chiefs of staff. And so anyway, I, I don't know if you had any thoughts or tips on, um, you know, if an, if an assistant already does all the stuff that you've been talking about, but they, for whatever reason, their executive or their company, either they're afraid of the, of the word chief in chief of staff, or they just don't want to give them that promotion or compensation bump. Um, what would you recommend those assistants who are like, man, I do all of this. I do. I have the executive communications bucket, the strategic initiatives, the OKRs and business ops. Um, but I'm not getting that respect or, or they won't give me that, that title. What, what would you say to those listening that are in those, uh, in that position? Yeah. So I think specifically over the last few years, there has been a phenomenal amount of research content, et cetera, that has become available to the broader population that really helps to effectively break down the role of chief of staff and the way that chief of staff can drive business impact in an organization. Um, and so because there is so much more accessibility to kind of what the role is, how it can drive that impact in your organization, and more specifically, the delineation between an EA and, and chief of staff, there, there really isn't an excuse for that anymore, in, in my opinion. So it sounds harsh to say, but it, you know, if you're in a situation where um, you know, you're an executive assistant and you're kind of doing all these things and you're kind of optimizing for that title and that promotion and, and that, that kind of um, you know, just holistic chief of staff package, but you're not getting it, it's, it's probably time to move on at that point. And as I've mentioned, while there is some adjacency to these two worlds, the roles themselves are significantly different. And, you know, under no circumstances is it okay to be doing a completely different job than that of your title slash what you were hired to do. And, yeah. you know, if someone was hired as an fp &A analyst in the finance world, but, you know, kind of later came to the conclusion that they were doing the job of a manager, uh, you know, in the investor relations world, you'd either reclassify yourself as a manager in the investor relations world with your management or you'd probably find something else, right? I mean, this is exactly the same thing because there is definitely adjacency between, you know, what an fp &A analyst and somebody in investor relations does. The adjacency there is that they're both finance-driven roles, but they're very, very different as far as what they're focused on and what they're driving and kind of strategically what their remit is. Um, so, you know, I know that situations like this aren't always so cut and dry, but I do think it's important for chiefs of staff, EAs and leaders to kind of all understand equally that by design and intention, the role of an EA and the role of the chief of staff are very different roles. And so to me, this is almost a call and I, this is kind of piggybacking off of my last name and statement to all senior leaders to ensure that there is intention when you're hiring for chiefs of staff and EAs and that there's a fundamental understanding of, you know, what the two roles can execute, you know, for you and your organization based on, you know, kind of the remit of the roles. So, um, you know, I know I answered this in a pretty black and white kind of way as far as like, hey, you know, this is an ongoing struggle. It's, you know, you know, time to take a hike and, and maybe go check something else out. Um, but, you know, career development is a, a major passion point for me. And, you know, no one's looking out for your career development more than you are. And so I know these can be very challenging situations, but sometimes you have to cut your losses if you're finding that you're not getting the momentum that you, you should, in my opinion, in a situation where there is clear delineation between the two roles. Yeah. And what you said about the, there's more resources now that are available to anybody that can clearly delineate between EA and chief of staff. So that should help uh, assistants in this position, um, you know, put, put together that business case. And then, yeah, I agree. I mean, it's, it's obviously scary and um, challenging to try to just 
leave your job and find another one. But if you're doing a role, like you mentioned, if you're doing a role that you're not being fairly um, recognized and, and compensated for, then yeah, it's, it's definitely time to move on. All right. So what if you're an assistant listening and you're like, I want to be able to do all that. I, I, I strive to do all that. What's something that um, assistants can do to prepare themselves for the chief of staff role someday? It's a great question. I, I tend to follow my current roles framework when answering this question, kind of leveraging that communications, biz ops, program management, bucketing that we, you know, talked about a bit today. You know, I, I think developing yourself within a variety of different skill sets is really one of the best things you can do to prepare for this role or any role, right? So I think specific to the chief of staff role and kind of breaking it down in those buckets first, you know, I've mentioned this, having some communications chops is key to the success in a chief of staff role, right? I was, I would go as far as to say that this is the most important skill to develop and one that I utilize the most. It's everything from working with senior leaders to craft compelling narratives around business critical initiatives to taking highly complex ideas and distilling them down to simple digestible concepts to being able to effectively and efficiently communicate an idea or an initiative to every type of audience. Communications is everything in this role. And, you know, I alluded to the term dot connector earlier as the chief dot connector of your organization in a chief of staff role. We can't connect the dots if we can't efficiently and effectively communicate. So any opportunity to develop these skills through public speaking opportunities or, or kind of comms coursework, et cetera, I think is, is really, really important and, you know, beneficial to, to everything, right? Not just, you know, you optimizing for a future chief of staff role, but, you know, communications really makes the world go around in a lot of ways. You know, secondly, having, as I mentioned earlier, having significant project and program management experience is incredibly important for anyone looking to step into this role. Uh, not just for the obvious reasons of wanting to ensure that you're comfortable with various, whether it be project management frameworks, working styles, et cetera, but also being used to working with every type of stakeholder across a business, which PMs oftentimes do, right? There's kind of that, that political nature to, to the world of program project management. So being able to effectively stand up a process, a system, a policy with the help of a variety of different business profiles whether that be you know, engineers, go-to-market folks, IT folks, finance professionals, et cetera. This to me has always been one of the biggest challenges to project management, right? Is the ability to bring people with different types of business backgrounds together to the table to accomplish a centralized effort. So any experience one can get contributing to or leading projects is hugely important. Now, whether that be through coursework, getting a, a PMP, or you know, taking on stretch projects in the organization that you're already in to really kind of build up on those program project management chops. I mean, I, I would say that that's, that's very, very important. And lastly, on the biz ops front, it's, it's hard to boil this down into various things. Um, you know, to channel in preparation for a role like this, but I'll say that the ability to analyze data and quickly make decisions based on what that analysis is, is, is it's really important, right? As an extension of the leader or leadership team in a strategic capacity in a chief of staff role, it's important to do your best to know as much as they know, and in certain situations, know more so that you can provide that sometimes very necessary strategic advisory to avoid potential challenges down the road. So net, net, Skill development, Jeremy, is very, very important in, in preparing for a role like this. And, and I think, thankfully, you know, if you're sitting in a large organization already or have access to, you know, a variety of different business backgrounds and partnership frameworks, et cetera, you can oftentimes take advantage of that to take on stretch projects or get sponsorship to do different certifications, programs, et cetera. But I think skill development is, is really key here. Would there be maybe uh, one or two either books or courses or, you know, you mentioned the PMP, but is there any, like maybe your favorite book or resource to help kind of that's helped you in your development for this role? Yeah. So I'm a huge proponent for professional development organizations. So when I first stepped into this role, 
I joined an organization called the, the Chief of Staff Network. It was formerly called the Chief of Staff Tech Network, uh, is now called just the Chief of Staff Network. And it's essentially a, a grouping, right, of chiefs of staff across the technology industry from all around the world that work in, you know, all different size companies, startups to major enterprises, et cetera, um, that, that kind of get together to, to drive knowledge sharing and share tips and tricks and tools and processes and frameworks. And, you know, I, I was part of the, the San Francisco Bay Area chapter and kind of pre-COVID, um, the chapter would meet every month at a different person's office, right? So one month I would host, you know, the, the meetup at, at Box and, you know, another month it'd be maybe over at Chime or Brightwheel or, you know, wherever it was. And just sitting in a room with other people that are in this very unique position was incredible. Uh, and there was so much that I took from that experience and was able to apply to what I was doing and what I am doing on a day-to-day -day basis, right? And so I think for me, I get uh, a lot of benefit from you know professional development organizations and meetups and talking with like-minded people that have you know similar goals, similar interests, that work in very similar environments. I think that's, in my opinion, where a lot of the, the magic happens when it comes to learning and developing. Um, I'll, I'll be honest, I'm not a huge reader, so I don't have like a specific book or tool or system or what have you that, uh, has been kind of incredibly life-changing for me, but joining that organization and getting access to uh, tons of individuals that are in the same exact position as me in very similar industries and very similar environments, that's where I've, I feel like I've grown 10 X over the last couple of years. Yeah, you know, the community aspect is such a big, big part of, and I think probably one of the most important parts of professional development. So that's great. And those who are listening, you know, Chief of Staff Network does have some public um, blogs and resources. Um, so if you're not a Chief of Staff yet, um, you can still learn from their site. So I'll put that in the show notes. All right. So Connor, it's been a great interview. I just want to wrap up real quickly. What's your favorite part about the role? So I, I alluded to this a little bit earlier, um, but to circle back, for me, it's the education factor. You know, in a role like this, you're oftentimes partnering with and learning from the most influential and senior leaders in any organization. And so, you know, chiefs of staff have a very unique opportunity to see how all the pieces come together at an altitude that's you know, normally reserved for the C-suite, right? And, and senior leaders. And so, um, I, you know, I've mentioned it earlier, I mentioned it again, I, I firmly believe that this is one of the best leadership accelerators out there. Um, I'll also mention that, and, and there's pros and cons of this, right? This is what I love about the role, but sometimes what I don't love about the role. Um, is no two days are the same. It keeps the job really interesting, right? So, you know, you start to get into a rhythm of certain initiatives or tasks on a call it quarter over quarter basis or, you know, weekly basis or what have you. But at the end of the day, you're really at the mercy of your environment. And that ambiguity is really exciting to me. I get a lot of strange looks when I mentioned that, but for, for better or for worse, my entire career, Jeremy, has been built around jumping into really uncomfortable situations and, and making the best of it. Um, you know, I'll go on just a kind of a, a quick tangent here as far as what has inspired that point of view. But when I started my career many years ago at HP, uh, I was at the company maybe six months uh, before the 80 year old hundred billion dollar legacy tech behemoth that most of the world had come to, to know as a you know very specific organization brand, et cetera, announced it would be splitting into two separate publicly traded companies, which are today known as HP Inc. and Hewlett Packard Enterprise. So, you know, this newly graduated business operations analyst, right, was really scratching his head, wondering what the heck he had gotten himself into. And, you know, what I didn't realize then, but quickly came to realize after is how much good can come from change and transformation as far as opportunities and learnings and, you know, working and living through one of, if not the largest corporate tech splits transformations in tech history has a lot to do with my desire to pursue organized chaos 
and like my ability to like thrive in ambiguity. And so, um, you know, kind of summary, it's, it's the education factor, you know, the exposure, but it's also just the no two days are the same. Um, and you really never know what you're going to get. Uh, and that to me is, is very exciting. Yeah. I love, uh, I love the EA role as well, because, um, you know, there, there's never a dull moment. And I just, I just love that I'm never bored in my job because <laughs> I don't know if I could do a job for very long if I, uh, if it was the same thing every day. So I can definitely appreciate that. Yeah. It's, it's a bit of a, a double-edged sword for a lot of, uh, you know, chiefs of staff I talk to where they, they take on the role because they're excited to have that, you know, no day is the same and working on a variety of different challenges and working cross-functionally, but that can also become very exhausting mm -hmm. after a while. And so um, then it's also like, okay, I'm ready to focus. But then there's that fear to kind of focus on something specific, because then you're going to have that kind of like fear of missing out. I miss the chaos. I miss the craziness. So it's, yeah, it's the psychology behind. It's very, very fascinating. Hmm. Well, Connor, thank you so much for being on the show. Um, is there somewhere that people can reach out to you and say hi or connect and see what you're up to? Absolutely. Yeah. So, um, Jeremy, if you want to actually share the link to my LinkedIn in your show notes, uh, if you do that, I'm more than happy to connect on LinkedIn. Uh, certainly over the last year and a half, as we've all been kind of navigating through these very unique and challenging times, LinkedIn has become one of my absolute favorite tools. And, you know, I've developed some really amazing connections virtually uh, over that time with people just kind of dealing with this ambiguity and and kind of unique situation in very different ways and um it's it's a platform that i think has for the most part kind of stayed away from some of the you know political division right that we see on other social media platforms and so you know i spend a lot of time on linkedin and and really like what it does for people and the access that it gives people and so uh yeah i feel free to reach out to me there i'm always happy to connect cup of coffee glass of wine email whatever it is. I, uh, I'm, I'm all about it. Awesome. Well, I'll put that in the show notes for sure. And yeah, thanks again. Uh, best of luck to you in your journey as a chief of staff and we'll talk soon. Absolutely. Thanks for having me again, Jeremy. Uh, really appreciate it. Thank you for listening. Check out the show notes at leaderassistant.com slash one, two, zero. That's leaderassistant.com slash one, two, zero. Have a great day and we'll talk to you next time. Please review on Apple Podcasts. Go Bullos.com.